This lecture is being brought to you in part by the generous gifts of these sponsors. All right. Thank you for joining me tonight. Um, I do want to warn you what I'm about to share with you is so surprising that you'll ask yourself how this possibly happened. Uh, what has happened to the wine industry all over the world, but particularly in the United States. So um, everything I'm going to share with you, you can find easily on our website, all the link outs to National Institute of Health, World Health Organization, uh, additive government documents. Uh, you can also find out everything I'm going to share with you with a simple Google search. This may be the best kept secret in the United States. The wine industry has, um, <clears throat> the wine industry spends a lot of money in Washington to keep all this secret. Wine is the only major food product without a contents label on it. And that, my friends, is not an accident. I'm going to share all of how this happened and what's really in wine as we go along. A little bit about me, because I'm a little bit of a crazy character. Uh, I only eat once a day. I've been on a ketogenic diet for seven years. In my 40s, I started planning for my 60s. I'm now 62. And now, in my 60s, I'm planning for my 90s. Uh, so I, uh, I'm a health and wellness enthusiast. Uh, I like to think of myself as a wellness and longevity architect, lifestyle. But a big part of lifestyle is about having fun and joy, and wine brings that to me. And we're going to talk about the toxicity and dangers of alcohol and why I tell people that alcohol is a very dangerous neurotoxin and we should be conscious about how we have a relationship with it. But nonetheless, so is joy and enjoyment, and so... I think it's, for me, wine is a big, joyful part of my life. What I'm going to tell you tonight is what I call the dirty, dark secrets of the wine business. Prepare yourself to be pretty compelled by the data and the information I'm going to give you. This is not marketing speak. These are government documents and, um, and chemical classifications from the National Institute of Health and the World Health Organization. Here's how we got here. Wine got rolled up is the term that they use in private equity and on Wall Street. The wine industry in the last 30 years has been consolidated. And what that has, the result of that has been factory wines. Now, they're not like the box wines you think about or Two Buck Chuck. These are wines that, that you would identify as trusted brands that are now owned by huge multi-billion dollar conglomerates. And as I've noted here on this slide, the top three largest wine companies in the United States, just three, make 60% of U.S. wines. And the top 25 wine companies in the United States make 90% of all production. So how this happens is that these trusted Napa Valley brands or other esteemed uh, brands that you may trust and feel that you know, uh, most of them are owned by these multi-billion dollar conglomerates. Now, they don't want you to know that, so they hide behind thousands of brands and labels. So when you go into a bottle shop or a grocery store and you see hundreds of bottles or even thousands, most of these wines are produced by just a handful of companies. Again, everything I'm going to share with you is tied back to industry sources or Google searches on our website, or you can find out for yourself. All this information is public. This is what a real natural wine cellar looks like. That's in Umbria, Italy, in an ancient castle that uh, the guy in the white T-shirt is the wine grower there. And, and makes wine for us. Here's what's happening all over the world. We are killing the soil, and the primary offender to that is glyphosate. 
Glyphosate is the number one herbicide applied in U.S. vineyards. Only 5% of U.S. vineyards are organic, and around the world, across Europe, only 9% are organic. You'll hear me speak about natural wines, which is what I sell. Much of this will be somewhat confusing to you because when I tell people that I drink natural wine, they ask me, aren't all wines natural? And no, they're not for the reasons that I'm going to describe for you. But among the things that makes them unnatural is industrial farming and the widespread use of chemical farming uh, that began in the 1920s. There's this massive collusion between the wine industry and the U.S. government that is dangerous to our health. This collusion is also taking place in the food industry. I'll give you the irony in the food industry. The MyPlate.gov, which used to be the food pyramid, which has made recommendations for some five decades about how you should eat and what you should be consuming, the MyPlate.gov is administered and managed by the Department of Agriculture. And the Department of Agriculture is not a health authority. Their primary goal is to sell grains. And so the same thing's happening in the wine industry. The, the alcohol industry is not managed by the F, FDA. It's managed by the TTB. Now, all this ties into this sort of governmental story. The TTB is a taxing authority that's a division of the Treasury Department. And their goal is not to make you healthier. Their goal is to generate more tax through the sale of alcohol. In Washington, this is how, this is how money is exchanged for power and special interest. I didn't need to educate you that, about that, but I do want, I'm going to draw the lines and connect the dots between the wine industry and the government. Labels. As I mentioned earlier, wine is the only major food product without a contents label on it. And if it had a contents label on it, it'd look much like the one on the right there, although it'd be filled with all these things on the left. Um, now, there are 76 additives approved by the TTB for the use in winemaking. Let me tell you about a few of those additives. Legal additives are health hazards, according to the National Institute of Health, which is also a government agency. So on one hand, you've got one agency telling you that, um, that they're okay, and another telling you that they're health hazards. The National Institute of Health has the following classifications for these additives. Now, 76 additives in total, in fairness, some of them are natural. Two of them are classified by the NIH as acute toxins. Acute toxin is a very specific clinical term. It means that a single exposure or multiple exposures over a 24-hour period will result in uh, health hazards and or death. Uh, Twelve of these additives are classified by the NIH as health hazards. Three of these additives are made from six different animal organs, including pig livers and cow stomachs. Six of these additives are made from known mycotoxins, including okra toxin A, which is a known carcinogenic. Now, what the wine industry will tell you about these additives, none of which are required to make wine high-quality wines. We don't allow any of these additives to be used. But what the wine industry will tell you is that these additives are in such small amounts that they're not unhealthy. And there's no real science to support that, but my position is, as, as a health, um, as someone who's interested in health and wellness, I don't want to drink these additives in any amount. Let me talk about one in particular. Now, what you see in the background here is the Code of Federal Regulations. Again, all this is on our website. This is the actual list of the 76. This is just the top of the page uh, for the purposes of our presentation. Um, <clears throat> this is the actual code section that contains the 76 additives that are permitted in the use of winemaking. The one I pointed out here is the most lethal and toxic of them all. It's called dimethyl dicarbonate. 
Dimethyl dicarbonate is used to sterilize wine and to treat the single most common bacterial fault found in wine known as Brettanomyces. I'm sorry to disturb any of you if this concerns you or depresses you, but I just want you to be informed about what you're potentially drinking in your wine when you decide to have a drink of wine. Fortunately, I sell wines that don't contain any of this. I'm very privileged to be able to make a living doing it, and part of the way I do that is that I help people understand potentially what they are drinking. And once they learn, they oftentimes make decent different choices, which allows me to make a living. So in fairness, I sell wine that don't contain any of these things, and, um, and I think it's better for you to drink that. And whether you buy it from me or not, I think you should be drinking natural wines that are organically grown. If you look down in the lower right-hand corner here, you'll see uh, from the NIH, which is also a government agency that publishes classifications on chemicals in the United States, you'll see that dimethyl dicarbonate is flammable, corrosive, an acute toxin, and a health hazard. Uh, this chemical is used to treat tens of millions of gallons of California wine and wine all over the U.S. and around the world. It's produced by a chemical company in uh, California, in Petaluma. How did this happen? Uh, well, this is part of the collusion. So some of you in here, probably Ken, will know uh, the Center for Science and Public Interest, which is a nonprofit in, um, in Washington, D.C., that has worked strenuously over the years on um, a number of nutritional initiatives, including uh, sugar and uh, nutritional information and ingredient labels on food. And in and, and fairness, for those of you who know their history, I don't agree with everything that they've done, but they have been very vocal and active in something that does interest me, which is transparent labeling on, uh, on alcohol products and wine. Nineteen years ago, this became more relevant recently, nineteen years ago, CSPI filed a 16-page well-cited and supported petition with the Trade and Tax Bureau, uh, which is a division of the Treasury Department, as you'll see at the top. A 16-page petition to um, to requesting hearings and a transparency on wine labels and alcohol labels. For 19 years, this petition sat dormant, crushed by industry influence. Until six weeks ago, on October the 6th, they filed a federal lawsuit against the Treasury Department to move this initiative forward. That doesn't mean that we're going to get transparent labeling on alcohol products. It just means that we now have an active lawsuit, which we support this lawsuit and their activities. I mentioned earlier that I, I did want to, in fairness, and this surprises people coming from me because they think I'm here to sell wine and I do enjoy a, a nice living from the sale of natural wines that are pure and lower in alcohol and sugar free and I'll tell you more about them, but I also believe, and I'm not alone, that Alcohol is a very dangerous neurotoxin. That doesn't keep me from drinking it. What it does make me do is be more conscious about it and helps me um, feel compelled to uh, share this story with more and more people. And I've told millions of people the story I'm telling you tonight, primarily through podcast. But I'm not sure... I recently I follow a health leader and a doctor who's a friend of Ken and has been on his podcast. His name's Dr. Peter Atia. And Dr. Atia has positioned himself as a longevity expert and recently did a podcast on the topic of alcohol. He, by the way, also drinks wine. He drinks our wine. Um, and <clears throat> he also drinks... Um, Japanese whiskeys, and he doesn't drink a lot, but he does drink. But on this podcast, he, he said um, he can't be convinced that ethyl alcohol in any amount is probably healthy for anybody. 
And I probably think that's true as well, but that doesn't stop me from consuming it because you might remember back in the beginning, wine brings me a lot of joy. So does drinking with my friends, and I rather like getting high. Anybody else in here like getting high? <laughs> All right, so, so, you know, so it's, so, but I do want people to think about, my job is not to come here and sell wine tonight. I don't have any sign-up forms. I'm not trying to, to, to recruit you. My primary objective is to educate you and have you make an informed decision about what you should be drinking for your health. But alcohol level in, in American wines has been rising steadily over the last 30 years. 30 years ago, um, wines in the United States averaged in the 12, 12 and a half percent range. Today, they're nearly 15 percent. The wine industry likes alcohol for reasons I don't need to describe to you. There are two reasons. One, alcohol is addictive. Number two, alcohol is a domino drug. And for those of you who drink on a regular basis, you know that that domino drug means that the more alcohol you drink, the more likely you are to drink more. So the wine industry likes it. I'm actually not a fan of alcohol. Uh, I'm a fan of well-made, low-alcohol wines that allow me to have con consum conscious consumption. But if I drink too much alcohol, I don't feel well. I expect most of you don't either. So let me talk about what a natural wine is. Natural wine, again, is, a, a, I think, a... Con uh, a confusing term. Natural wine, and it plays into the slide, that's the reason I want to go here. Natural wine is wine that is always organically or biodynamically grown. And biodynamic farming was developed by an Austrian scientist in the 1920s named Rudolf Steiner. Biodynamic farming, the best way, we could spend a half hour on biodynamic farming, the best way I like to describe what biodynamic means is it is a prescriptive form of advanced organic farming. So first of all, natural wines are always organic or biodynamically grown. Now to further confuse you, not all organic wines are natural. So when you go, for reasons I'm about to describe to you, when you go in the store and you see an organic wine, that simply means it was grown with organic grapes. It doesn't mean it's natural wine. Natural wine further gets confusing because when you look at food products and you see the term natural, it's generally a phrase that's used in food marketing to suggest that it's organic or better for you when it actually has no legal meaning at all. Natural wine has no official legal meaning either, although there's an international standard and understanding of what a natural wine is. Now, my company, Dry Farm Wines, does have a certification, and we'll talk about what that certification means because it's over and beyond just being natural wine. Natural wine is the, the, the starting bar of our certification because we really think of ourselves as a health food company that sells wine we have many other things we're concerned about other than just being natural wine. We also want it to be sugar-free, lower in alcohol, low in naturally occurring sulfites. So, but natural wine, always organic or biodynamically grown. It is fermented, natural wine is fermented with wild native or yeast that are native and wild to the vineyard where the grape grew. So these wild native yeast when you pick a grape berry at harvest, no matter how it's been farmed, no matter where it is, every grape berry at the time of harvest has a white waxy film on the skin of the berry. You can scrape it off with your fingernail. You can see it right there to the left. That white waxy film is yeast. It's wild native yeast that was collected in the air in the vineyard. Now, Wild native yeast are the only yeast permitted to be used in natural wine fermentation. In conventional wines, they use a GMO lab-cultured yeast like the product shown on the right. Um, these yeasts have been modified in several ways. One, to be sturdier 
You can make wine in very large volumes with them. With the wild native yeast, they're too temperamental. You can't make wine in large volume, which is why natural wine growers can't make wine in large volume. So to make wine in these factories or in big wineries, you must use a genetically modified uh, lab-grown yeast. They also, as I've noted here, they withstand a higher alcohol environment than a native yeast. And you can buy them in various flavor profiles. Uh, you might know, for those of you who bake or who were a part of the pandemic sourdough baking sort of phenomena, that yeast, different yeast impart different flavors. And so these yeasts are modified if you, for example, if you grow an industrial grape in central California with a bunch of chemicals of poor quality and you want it to taste like it's from the Mediterranean, they have a yeast for that. Uh, finally, the other thing that happens in conventional wines that we believe is very unhealthy is that bottling, uh, the, the third leg of the stool in natural wines is that they're additive free. So organic or biodynamic native yeast fermentation and no additives. At bottling with conventional wines now, massive doses of sulfur dioxide are added to the wine to kill everything, including um, gut friendly micro uh, in, 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 including bacteria that, it, that live inside natural wines because natural wines have not been sterilized or killed or what we call mummified, right? Because they haven't been sterilized with sulfur dioxide, they still have living bacteria in them. And those living bacteria, as David, Dr. David Perlmutter has written a number of times about natural wines and the living bacteria that exist in natural wines and the bacteria is very... Uh, supported to the mic micro gut biome. So this is another, sulfur dioxide is one of the two acute toxins. And now in, in, in fairness, sulfur has been used since the Romans to preserve wine. The question is how much is used. Uh, the U.S. legal limit is 350 parts per, mil per million. We don't allow it and our average wine tests out at 39 parts per million. So the legal U.S. limit is nearly 10 times the average of sulfites that are found in our wines. How to drink healthy wines. This is some of my crew, and uh, we drink a lot of wine. Uh, we went through what is a natural wine. But we think of it as a philosophy of pure artisan wines, handcrafted with honesty. In our particular case, this is, not, um, this is not a requirement of natural wine. Natural wine, again, only has three, three tenets, the organic, the native yeast, and additive free. But we also require that no irrigation be used on any of the... This guy in the white T-shirt, is that's in the vineyard. This is another notable thing. I'm going to talk about the way these vineyards look in a moment. But we don't allow irrigation to be used in the farming of any of our grapevines. Irrigation didn't come to grape farming until the early 1970s. Today, less than 1% of U.S. vineyards are dry farmed. Almost everything is irrigated. Irrigation on the farms that we work with, we work with about 900 small family farms around the world. We do not sell any domestic wines. There are no domestic wines that meet our criteria of purity and health. But just on the 900 farms that we work with, um, we save 1.4 billion gallons of water a year not irrigating. So again, it's not, it's not a tenet of natural wine, but most natural wine is dry farm, not all of it. Let me go back for a second, and we're going to look at several of these, but... That's actually a vineyard in front of you. And for any of you who have ever been to Napa Valley or seen an American vineyard, they don't look like that. So the reason being is that these, you can see it's a forestation. And I'll have other slides coming up. So in a natural vineyard, the, the, the farmer wants all of nature to be present. So 
he or she wants insects and grasses and flowers and bees and biodiversity because that's how nature is balanced. And when you start removing all these things, nature gets out of balance, and that's when you have to use chemicals to farm. And so I'll have several pictures of natural vineyards, but they oftentimes, as in the case with this farmer, oftentimes they also do not plow because when there are billions of, of microorganisms below the surface of the earth uh, in the topsoil, and when you turn that soil over and it faces the sun, all of those organisms die. And so those organisms as a part of living soil are what allow farmers to not irrigate and not to use nutrients like nitrogen and fertilizers to have healthy fruits. At Dry Farm Wines, our health and purity standards go beyond just natural. So we have independent lab testing by a certified analogist on every single one of our wines. They are all less than 12.5% alcohol. We sell wines between 7% and 12.5% alcohol. Most of the wines I drink are between 9 and 11%, just because that's the taste of wine that I prefer. And I'm not a guy who has a glass or two. I'm more likely to drink a bottle over the course of a night. Bottle a day keeps the doctor away, so I say. And if I'm drinking lower alcohol wines, then I can consume more volume of wine without having negative remnants. And I just like drinking wine. I occasionally drink too. Um, they're sugar-free. The only way to know if a wine, the only way to know if a, I look pretty good for two bottles a day, don't you think? Um, so, it's not every day. Um, they're mold-free. Um, all, all of our wines are, are, are tested for okra toxin A. That is a legal requirement in the EU that all wines are screened for okra toxin A. That is not a requirement in the United States. And so, as far as I know, virtually no wines would be tested for okra toxin A here. It's a pretty expensive test. Uh, they're toxin-free, and sulfites can be as high as 75 parts per million naturally occurring. We almost never see it. And as I mentioned, our average sulfite um, test is 39 parts per million. We're endorsed by over 1,000 health and medical leaders. These are just a few that some people know, but uh, Dr. Dominic Diagostino has been on Ken's podcast a few times. He's also, I believe, he's on the board of IHMC. Uh, Rob Wolf is well known in the paleo community, Mark Susson. All of these are well known. These are just a, a few, but they're probably today, I think, 17 or 1800 of these health and medical leaders who endorse our wines for the reasons I've explained to you. Uh, this common most, the single most common question that I get is, how is your wine sugar-free? Isn't there sugar in grape juice? And so just to tell you how, this is actually fermenting wine here. Uh, this is a red wine, as you can see. And those bubbles are the fermentation. It's the yeast eating the sugar. So how wine is made is you inoculate, or in the case of natural wine, it's called a spontaneous fermentation. Because remember, the yeast is already on the grape skin. So you you press the juice from the grape berry, it goes into a tank, it already contains the yeast, so you'll create a spontaneous fermentation if it's a natural wine. If it's a conventional wine, the juice will go in the tank, they'll pour sulfur dioxide in to kill the native yeast, and then they'll inoculate it with the lab cultured GMO yeast, for reasons I've already described to you. Now, then what happens next in red wine is that you take all the skins, the seed, and the stems from the press, and you put that in the tank as well. Red wine gets its color from skin contact and also its tannin structure from contact with the seeds, the stems, and the skin. If you take a white wine grape and a red wine grape and you squeeze the juice from both, they're basically clear. Red wine gets its color from the skin. It's also where it gets its additional polyphenols, flavonoids, and nanoflavonoids, and other compounds that are thought to impart 
health benefits. The most famous one is known as resveratrol. You've probably heard of that. Dr. David Sinclair, who has a biology lab at Harvard and is a anti-aging uh, authority, um, has published widely on the benefits of resveratrol. It also, in fairness, tell you that you have to drink a lot of wine to get any benefit from resveratrol that has been shown in lab animals. So don't drink red wine for the resveratrol, but that's the most famous polyphenol. When you inoculate, or in the case of natural wine, you have a spontaneous fermentation, yeast be begins to eat the sugar. Uh, the, the sugar is the food source for the yeast. And as long as the winemaker allows the yeast to eat all of the available sugar in what's known as a fully fermented wine, the wine will be sugar-free. Now, that doesn't, that doesn't always happen in conventional wines. In conventional wines, there's desire Americans like sugar. Sugar adds mouthfeel to wine. Sugar gives long finishes to wine. So sugar is a desirable addition to many winemakers. Now, to clarify, you don't add sugar to wine. It's, it's not added. It's actually left behind. So when you're fermenting, remember the yeast is eating the sugar and it causes this foaming at the top, like this bubbling. That's actually the fermentation process of the yeast eating sugar. And when it eats the sugar, the byproduct is ethyl alcohol and carbon dioxide. And that foam you see at the top is basically the bubbles created by the carbon dioxide. So if you allow it to fully ferment, the yeast will die because they've eaten all the available sugar and there's no food source for them anymore. In the, in the edge of the tank where the fermentation is taking place, there's this small, really simple device that tells the winemaker at any time how much sugar is left in the tank. And when the winemaker has the desired amount of sugar they want to leave behind in the industry, it's known as RS, or residual sugar, when they've reached the level of desirable residual sugar, they again pour sulfur dioxide into the wine to kill the, the GMO yeast. Remember, they originally used sulfur dioxide to kill the native yeast. Now they use it again to kill the um, GMO yeast, leaving behind the desired amount of sugar. That's how sugar gets in wine, or if it's fully fermented, how wine becomes sugar-free. So, fair to note, being sugar-free is not, is not a natural wine attribute. It's an attribute of fully fermented wine. So even if, even, so you can have conventional wines that are also sugar-free. It just means they've been fully fermented. So it's not, the only way to know if a wine is sugar-free is to lab test it, which is why we independently lab test every wine. Even for taste experts like us who drink copious amounts of wine and taste copious amounts of wine, you can't always taste the sugar unless it's super sweet, right? Because wine also has a high acid level. As a result, it could contain five or six or seven grams per liter and you wouldn't be able to taste it, so necessarily. And wine can range from zero or near zero grams of sugar per liter. That's how sugar is measured in, in, uh, in wine. And I would mention I'm rabidly anti-sugar, and for any of you who are my, I, there are a number of my customers in here, and they know that we publish letters and information on a number of things, uh, including sugar and meditation and fitness and all kinds of information that we publish that are not just on wine. In fact, one of my customers mentioned tonight who's in the audience, a doctor who's here, that he enjoyed seeing a recent letter that I published that um, I mentioned in the letter that one of my travel hacks for staying away from sugar is that when I check into a hotel room, I have them remove all the snacks from the mini bar because invariably I might come back in after one of those one or two bottle nights <laughs> and uh, I'm going to get in the mini bar and have a Snickers bar or, you know, something that is totally against my desire, but I just fall down into that trap. So the easiest way for me to avoid that trap is just to have everything removed. And uh, because I just really tried 
diligently to live a sugar-free life. Um, coming up, I'm going to buzz right through so we can take some questions. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of irrigation because irrigation is a whole nother wormhole like um, that we could go down about all the problems associated. In addition to wasting water, it produces a lower quality fruit. Um, it produces a fruit that's lower in polyphenols. Uh, there's all kinds of problems associated with irrigation. Irrigation is used to make wine cheaper uh, and more valuable. It, it probably isn't lost on you two things. If you irrigate, it makes it a whole lot easier to farm. So do chemicals. And also, when you irrigate, when you fill up, when you fill a grape berry with water, it might not surprise you that it weighs more. And fruit is sold by the tons. So the more it weighs, the more it's worth. It also makes farming, it also irrigation and nitrogen, which is liquid fertilizer, which is just exactly when it's irrigated, it also gets nitrogen through the same tube. Um, irrigation creates a bigger cluster or a larger cluster or yield with fruit that weighs more. And since it's sold by the pound, by the ton, it's just simply worth more. Uh, the other problem with irrigation, when you get back, when you return to the winemaking, yeast eating the sugar, and that creates alcohol, the higher the sugar at the time of harvest will determine the amount of alcohol in the wine. And since I'm also not a fan of alcohol and suggest that you and I both drink lower alcohol wines, I also like the taste of them better. If, if the sugar level is higher, that means the alcohol level will also be higher at the end of fermentation. And this is, sugar level is measured with a device in the field um, that measures what's called bricks. The bricks is the amount of sugar in, in the fruit. The higher that sugar gets, the higher that corresponding alcohol will be at the end of fermentation. This is also common sense. If you fill a grape berry with water by irrigating it, you have to pick it at higher sugar levels in order to have proper flavor. That results in higher alcohol levels. I'm gonna get right through this there's the next few slides so we can take some questions and round up on time. But natural farming is way beyond organic. Again, this is me standing in, in a forestation of a vineyard in, in, um, in Puglia, Italy, uh, with this old Italian farmer who doesn't speak a, virtually any English. And um, <clears throat> he also doesn't plow. Um, and you can see how thick, this is inside of a vineyard, right? How thick all around he, he has all kinds of plants and grasses and herbs and, and flowers and a lot of biodiversity to, to keep a healthy vineyard without the use of chemicals. Uh, these are more, you can see, these are like bird, uh, like birdhouse up there and there's cows and bees and this particular farmer on the lower left is in Austria. He, his family for a few generations has been planting wildflowers beneath their um, vineyards. I found this on the web. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll see an irrigation hose. That irrigation hose behind him is actually, is actually a spray. It's not a drip. It's it's uh, feeding these wildflowers that won't survive without some form of irrigation. But they, they plant these particular flowers to attract particular types of insects. Uh, living soils, this, this is that same old Italian farmer. Um, the guy on the far right is my interpreter. And uh, he describes you know, when he pulls up and he holds the soil, he describes the little animals inside and what he's talking about are the insects. And, but, you know, because he, when he speaks to me in English, he says, the little animals, right? It's kind of charming, but um, this is what his vineyard looks like. 
this is another vineyard, also in Puglia, Italy. Um, this is the same Puglia vineyard. You can just see that it's just a very wild place. Anyway, I'm... Could you try again? Part of my shtick. So this is a, uh, a small, ta a small uh, family farm in... Um, also in Puglia, uh, the, uh, this is the third generation of farmers. The grandfather's in the hat. He also doesn't speak English. This was after a, a Sunday afternoon lunch. And Sunday lunches in Italy start about 1 o'clock in the afternoon and go till dark. <laughs> and uh, so I'm, I'm really super grateful to be in a business where I can make a living supporting people who care about the same things I care about. And, uh, and there are not many of them left who are really stewards of the earth and stewards of a way of life. These are not business people. They are not, they don't make a lot of money. Um, they, uh, they just do something they believe um, strongly in doing. And uh, I'm super lucky to be able to get paid to support them. Uh, thank you for taking time to get a fire hose of information that uh, I know is a lot to absorb. I'm happy to take any questions if uh, if you guys have any questions for me. Wait, wait. Wait, wait. wait. I've got I guess one, we have a microphone. I've got, I've got one, two, three, four. Okay. Is this the dice? Here. Here, Olivia. Here, ready? Oh, my gosh. Oh, it's a microphone. Oh, shut up. Oh my God, this is awesome. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so many questions, but I'll start with the one that's been pressing on my mind first. Um, I also do natural practices. I have a natural skincare company um, and we do, we support natural farming and stuff. Um, however, is there, what are the restrictions in uh, Europe that differ um, as far as wine production versus the United States? Because I know they have different laws on different um, ingredients and stuff compared to the United States. What does that look like? And are there more farms in uh, Europe that do adhere to more of the natural practices than obviously here in the United States or other regions of South America where I know a lot of wine's been coming out of lately? Yes, 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 and yes. Okay. <laughs> All right, now, that being said, Yes and no. So generally speaking, there are 50, not, not generally, there are 56 additives approved in the EU for the use in winemaking. For reasons that I can only speculate, generally speaking, when you're in Europe, and I would, people tell me this all the time, in fact, I was just having a conversation with a couple here tonight about it. People say, you know, I can go to Europe, I have a bottle of wine for lunch, I have a bottle of wine at dinner, I feel different. Generally speaking, wines will be healthier and better in Europe where they've been making wine for over 3,000 years. And one of the things that we do really well in America is that we scale things, right? And we love to scale profitability and we just scale things. And so it's a little bit different in Europe. There's just a different mentality about business, not to say that there aren't multinational wine companies in Europe that are scaled as well. Just generally speaking, Europeans have a different sensibility than Americans. And so, generally speaking, wines, oftentimes, I think more so than here, you have multi-generational wine families. And so, some things that, I'm only speculating about why, generally speaking, European wines might be healthier. There's still plenty of additives there. Unless it's a natural wine, it's likely to have some additives in it. Unless it's organic or biodynamically farmed, it's they're utilizing industrial farming practices. But generally speaking, my experience is in drinking wines that are not natural. In other words, if I go into a restaurant, they don't have any natural wines. And I'm choose then I'm going to choose a European wine, probably from central France, where it's colder and I'm going to get lower alcohol levels. Generally speaking, I'll feel better. And I think most everybody else has that experience. But so... They're 56 versus 76, but I, there's no requirement. Somebody asked me earlier, there's no requirement to use additives here. There's no requirement there, 
right? So there's not a whole lot of regulatory issues there. It's just that they're permitted to be used. And here, because in America we want to make wine cheaper, faster, and at scale, they're just more widely used. Don't have a scientific answer for you on it. Good catch. Thank you. So uh, you say that you partner with these family farms all over the world. Do you ferment and bottle the wine there, or do you ship the grapes back here and ferment and bottle them here? It, it, is, um, <clears throat> it is blended. It's harvested, fermented, blended, and bottled and labeled at their farm. And then we pick it up from there and we bring it to the United States. Basically, my question is how they do it. We don't actually make the wine ourselves, but the criteria that we have is very specific and unusual. And so because we're the largest reseller of natural wines in the world, now many of these family farms make wines targeted at us. So if you go and you try and sell a sugar-free, low alcohol, you go out and try and sell this, nobody knows to buy it. And so, so they, don't, they weren't making wines specifically targeted our certification. So now they do because they, can, they, they target us with it. So, um, so they do make wines for us, but we don't actually make them ourselves. Thank you very much for what you do. I'm a subscriber, been Thank for many you. years. Okay. You permit me to make a decent <laughs> living. Thank you. I also am keto. And this is a and thank you for supporting those family farmers. That's wonderful. Thank you. But my this is a sincere question. You mentioned that there are six additives from animal organs. Yes. I'm a carnivore. I like animal organs. I, I don't have any issue with so, animal so organs. Why, why is, well, expand more about why those are an issue. Well, they're an issue for people who care about, there is a substantial portion of the population who is vegan or who cares about animal rights. Personally, I'm not vegan. Um, I had a very tasty cheeseburger just last night and threw the bun away. I am keto, so don't eat bread. But, but, um, uh, so, but there, there is a substantial portion of our audience and a substantial portion of people around the world who care about animal treatment, animal rights, and, are, and or are vegan. And for those people, um, it's fair for them to know that there are six animal organs that are used to make additives that go into wine. Um, and one of those is a fish bladder, and the other are both organs of, of, of pigs and cows. Fish bladders are very good. Yeah, exactly. So if you care about it, you care about it. If you don't, I eat fish and cow. Hello? Okay. <laughs> um, several years ago, I thought I heard a report about a class act suit in California against uh, wine, because wines like $10 and less had a very high level of arsenic in them. Can you address that? Yeah, it's true. I, I don't know a lot about that specific action, but this, um, and I'm not even sure, I'm familiar with the lawsuit, I'm not even sure what happened to it. Um, and I don't know much about it, but in independent lab testing, in California from two different groups across most of the major wine appellations in both organic and non-organic fruit, um, detectable and concerning levels of glyphosate have been uh, detected in wines as well as arsenic. I don't know the status of that lawsuit. I do remember it, but I, I don't read any, I haven't read anything about it recently, so one could presume it got settled or something, it means the lawyer's got a bunch of money. So I, I don't know, I don't know the status of it. I do know some of the people who were named in the suit because I lived in Napa Valley for the last 22 years, so I, I, that's how I know about it. But the glyphosate thing has been well published over 
two different studies, two different groups that have published on glyphosate. But again, glyphosate is not simply an American problem. I mean, Roundup is used all over the world. Although there are a number of countries that are in the process of banning it, fortunately, across Europe. So, best way to choose a natural wine other than searching for the word organic and sugar-free in a store? Well, impossible. I get this question <laughs> often. <laughs> um, when you live, you know, I have a home in Miami Beach, and which is a very international place. And even there, finding natural wine is extraordinarily difficult. Um, if you live in Kansas, there's no chance you would get it. I mean, it's just, it's just, there's, um, natural wines are just quite rare and they're not well understood and uh, you, you'd be very hard pressed to find them in retail here anywhere. Um, there, uh, there's, a, there's a smartphone app called Raisin that is a guide to natural wine restaurants and retailers around the world. Um, and even in a place like Miami, it's not, it's not, there's not many listings on it. But in New York, you would find San Francisco, Los Angeles. So in big urban markets um, where there's a lot of farm to table movements and people who are, you know, sort of interested in more obscure things, you will find nat natural wine bars, restaurants, and retailers. But they're only found in these dense urban markets. If you live anywhere outside of those cities, uh, it's, it's very difficult to find unless you buy it online. And uh, we hope if you do that you buy it from us. <laughs> Who's here in the back? Okay. All right. Oh, oh. Do you have a question? This is a little different, but your first slide, your daily stuff, the top two, can you expand on those? I'm sorry? The first slide when you do some daily things. The first slide. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah. so I, uh, yeah, so I have um, uh, cold thermogenesis. I have a cold plunge at my house, which is approximately 37 or 8 degrees. Uh, it's uh, basically a big tank full of freezing cold water. Um, but you can also achieve not exactly the same um, result by taking a cold shower. It's the next best thing. Or you can go to, there's probably a cryotherapy uh, studio or facility here in Ocala somewhere or nearby. Um, so there's a number of different ways to practice cold thermogenesis or heat treatment, saunas. Um, but my day starts with a cold shower, 28 minutes of meditation, and then I s alternate my days in the gym between um, zone two and zone five cardio and, and weightlifting. Um, those are sort of my morning routines. And as I mentioned, I don't eat until six o'clock at night, so I actually haven't eaten since last night. Um, no snacks, nuts, anything. I just coffee, tea, and water. Um, and I've been doing that for seven, almost seven years. Um, and for me, I would say that my fasting schedule, I started out ketogenic, but um, I would say fasting for me, and everybody's different. Everybody's uh, makeup is different, men and women, hormonal differences. And so, but for me personally, um, going to a once a meal day was the, the most meaningful advancement in my anti-aging wellness, I, I thought. And uh, now I'd never go back. I never think about eating. And the only reason I eat at night is because I want to drink. <laughs> and uh, I don't drink on an empty stomach. It's one of the hazards of fasting is, not, is uh, I need to get some I need to get some food in my stomach before I drink too much wine, or the results of that are not not pretty. I'm I'm a lot of fun. I'm very witty. I'm super cute when I'm drinking, but <laughs> I'm super super cute. I just have a 
a very selfish consumer driven question be, having been a long term subscriber thank you are you going to change your business model around a little bit so that when we get delightful wines from dry farm we can give a call and say i'd like more of this and not we get the answer what are you talking about and the answer is almost always no so I, I know it's changed a little bit over the last couple it of years. Ha it has. I know it probably has to do with availability, but still to the question, is that going to change? It has changed. Um, so it really, you know, um, our business grew really fast, and we were trying to just keep up with it and weren't, you know, it was just kind of a crazy story. and. And because, as you know, as a subscriber, you feel better when you drink our wines. The product speaks for itself, and it works. And so people drank a lot of it. And um, so we were just constantly trying to keep up with the demand that, fortunately, we were creating. But about a year ago, we put in a, a custom uh, fulfillment department where... <coughs> Even though we tell our customers about this, we don't do as good a job because people ask me this all the time. Actually, you can call what we call our customer experience team, custom custom experience team, and they will get you anything any way you want it, right? If you have a wine that, because these wines are in small volumes, oftentimes we run out. By the time you get it, drink it, like it, call us, it's gone. But this is a team of wine experts that can say, well, if you like this wine, then you'll also really like this wine as well, very likely. And as you know, we have 100% happiness promise, so any wine you don't like, uh, we'll refund it or send you a replacement with no questions asked. Um, so I hope you've not had to return any wine, but... Uh, Only one All right, nice, nice. <laughs> Well, if there's anything wrong with your wine, we stand behind it. Well, we, behind that too. Oh, we do. It's, it's, we replace wines every day. It's just the nature of being in the shipping business, shipping a product that's perishable, packed in glass that weighs a lot with, with the competencies and charms of UPS. So I'm going to take one last question from Olivia. You had your, oh, wait. Do we have a hand up back here? Oh, are you ready? Hi, so I was wondering, um, you commented on Peter Atia, who I follow pretty religiously. I stick with kind of the low carb, intermittent fasting, but I was wondering if you think, in terms of alcohol being a neurotoxin, is there a daily amount of alcohol that technically is still remains safe or healthy because- One to two bottles of natural bottles, wine. Bottles, okay. <laughs> so I, listen, I, I take the same position that Peter Atia takes which is, I, I, I believe that, and he believes this too, and he's a drinker, um, that, you know, ethyl alcohol probably in any amount is not widely beneficial to any human, uh, probably. I, 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 but that being said, and there are various studies showing people that have moderate consumption may have longer lives and so on and so forth. And I'd freely admit, and I talk about this on podcasts all the time, my life, my wellness possibly could be enhanced if I just stopped drinking altogether. Um, that's not going to happen. <laughs> and so <laughs> since I'm not going to stop drinking, I want to help you think about how to drink and how to drink more consciously through my experience and, you know, I, I, it's an occupational hazard of being in the wine business that I occasionally get drunk. <laughs> but, you know, I'm, I'm not a super fan of it. And, and, and I think I just, you know, I, I like, I tell people, you know, when, when we sit around and we talk about, um, you know, our... So PR firm will say, well, you know, do you think you should be out there telling people that alcohol is dangerous? I mean, are we trying to sell wine? Do you think you should tell people that maybe your life would be better off if you didn't drink wine? I was like, well, you see, here's the thing I know about drinkers. <laughs> the fact that you tell me that this is toxic is not going to stop me from drinking it. 
it's just going to help me think about how to drink it, right? And so, no, I don't think it's dangerous for my business to tell you that alcohol is toxic because it is. Uh, but, you know, I get a lot of joy from drinking wine and sharing it with people and sharing my wines. I'm very grateful, and I want to say thank you for everybody here who um, is my customer and allows me to make a living doing something I love. Thank you. Hope you had fun.